This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Welcome to another episode of Plain Talk Live. I, of course, am your host, Rob Port. There is, I, and I, I think my guest who will be joining me here in just a moment uh, will agree, there is a fracturing in the North Dakota Republican Party. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised that it's happening. The NDGOP has been in charge of North Dakota politics almost exclusively since the early 1990s. I mean, really, since the Clinton administration. Um, and, and even the early days of the Clinton administration, if you want to date it back maybe to when uh, former Governor Ed Schaefer was first elected to office. Um, you know, the, the Republicans, I believe, if I'm if I'm remembering my dates correctly, have held both chambers of the legislature since 1994. 95, I think, is when they actually took office, the 94 election. Um, they haven't the Democrats haven't held a statewide office if, uh, since 2008. Uh, when Roger Johnson stepped down from that office, uh, the Democrats haven't had anybody not named Heidi Heitkamp win a statewide election since 2008. <laughs> Heidi Heitkamp, of course, won a six-year term in the Senate in 2012, but then in 2018, she lost control of a Senate seat that Democrats had held on to since the Eisenhower administration. So Republicans are, are dominant, but I don't think you have that sort of dominance for that long without eventually maybe the party, you know, when, when political tents get big, you have to build coalitions and then they're, they're fracturing within those coalitions. So anyway, what this is all leading up to is a conversation that I wanted to have with state representative Jeff Hoverson. Now, Representative Hoverson is a, a Republican from Minot, but he's also a, a, a high profile, I would say, outspoken member of the Bastiat caucus. And as a matter of fact, in a previous conversation, Representative Hoverson, you told me that uh, you don't go to House Republican caucus meetings. You don't pay the dues. You still told me that you considered the Bastiat caucus to be your caucus. So I wanted to have you on and, and, and talk. And, and I, I think the first question to you, first of all, thanks for your time. And second of all, first question is, do you feel like I do that there's a fracturing in the North Dakota Republican Party? Yeah, actually, we're starting off on an agreement. I think it's just a fracture that's being revealed this year a lot more. And uh, just to clarify, if I might, uh, Rob, what what I what I what I said was, I think the Bastier Caucus is the Republican Party now. Um, so that's kind of what I meant when I said earlier that I do go to the Republican Caucus. It just happens to be the Bastier now. And so, I, and and that relates well to your your theme today of. The fracture in the Republican Party. I'd rather just define reality uh, rather than hiding from it. Yes, there is a fracture, and I think it's widening. Of course, it's not just North Dakota. Uh, the term rhino has been around for a while. I think we're hearing that a lot more. It's really a fracturing between, if you want to say rhino or, or more Democrat thinking coming into the Republican Party, however you want to say it. And then I think... Uh, when you look at the, uh, you know, individual liberty uh, platform of the Republican Party, that defines the Bastier, and I, and you know it, but it's it's really not a, a huge uh, secret thing. It, it's kind of like uh, uh, a, there's a prayer caucus, for example, at at the Capitol. There's a pro life caucus, and you know how many members are in the pro life caucus? Well. I don't know there's some people that maybe come once and others come, you know, every time and everywhere in between. So it's kind of hard to define it by membership uh, like you can with the two traditional caucuses because they actually are, you know, signed up members and, and legislators. I don't know if, if you caught my drift on that. Yeah, I, I think so. Although I, I spoke with um, in, in past conversations and interactions with State Representative Rick Becker, who is is credited with with founding the, the Bastiat Caucus. I mean, he's told me absolutely you have you have the Bastiat Caucus has. I mean, he's he's referenced it in public in in a column he wrote that they had dues paying members. 
Um, yeah, I think I think they tried that one year, but uh, certainly not this year. I'm a newcomer, okay. So, um, I mean, I I donate for pizza if that counts, <laughs> but I I you know I I'm a preacher, so I got I would be uh, remiss not that preachers don't lie, but I can put uh, my hand on a Bible and say I have not uh, signed a document to be a member or or paid dues. However, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, to be shied away from. If that was the opportunity, I would do it. Uh, but uh, it was more, hey, do you guys want to, anybody here want to donate? Because we're, we we eat pizza every Monday night. So, and yeah. they might bring in a speaker. We didn't do any paid speakers this year, but we had some, we had, I think, one or two speakers. I, it's it's interesting to me uh, because it, it almost seems like sometimes when, when I'm, I'm trying, those of us who are on the outside looking in at the Bastia Caucus, or trying to understand it. It sometimes feels like you guys are trying to have it. You're trying to have your cake and eat it too. On one hand, you just want to be a group of, of people who are getting together and eating pizza and talking policy. But on the other hand, you started this interview saying that you feel like the Bastiat caucus is the real Republican party. Well, these are two divergent things. What, what, what is it? I mean, is it a serious attempt to be, a, a, if not a, if not a third party, but a rump caucus, in the in the legislature and in and in state politics, or is it just uh, a, a more informal type of group that's that's organizing around a certain policy agenda? Like, and and I say agenda not pejoratively at all. Like like maybe a pro life caucus or something like that. I mean, is it which is it? Well, I you've maybe thought through that deeper and harder than I have. I guess Rob, I uh, I I mean, I think that like you know what's what's the saying uh, birds of a feather flock together um and you know this year uh i'm happy to say that Oli Oli is our leader uh so referring uh, to right. senator Oli larson Oli larson right right and so uh dan ruby was last year i mean we are that organized if that's what you're talking about we do try to have meetings that are substantive and have some order so yeah and and if i'm not hitting your question correctly yeah we do well, I, I, of... I mean just just oh. to clarify maybe what i'm oh, driving yeah. at is it's i mean to me i think it's a pretty remarkable thing for a person who received his local party's republican nomination and campaigned on the ballot as a republican you got that r by your name and and you know when you're in the legislature you're you're described as a republican but then you tell me the real Republican Party is not that Republican Party whose affiliation that you you campaigned for and received, and, and but but rather the Bastiat Caucus, which is not sanctioned by the the Republican Party at all. I mean, the Republican Party is a specific organization, as you well know. So I, I again, I, I guess that that's what's confusing to me. I mean, which is it? Well. Yeah, if, and I apologize. We just finished at midnight last night, so I might not be hearing you really clear. Sure. But as far as which is it, I, I think it's all the above. I mean, I I think that uh, I, I like I think people need to know the reality of the Republican Party. It, it's not a group of people that are are necessarily adhering. And, and I'll just I'll qualify that by saying my opinion. In my opinion, uh, it, it's it's a hard group to trust because you would think you know to your point about running with an r by your name if you look at my voting record it's pretty r i mean it'd be you can draw a straight line from every everything in our campaign brochures right to my votes and there's no there's not much wiggle at all and so uh if you're talking about joining a group of people or you're talking about a republican platform I did run on the Republican platform, and I, I would definitely consider myself a Republican. In fact, uh, I would say that, you know, a lot a lot of times, we say, well, we're a conservative Republican. I don't really like that because I don't think the word Republican should have to be qualified by the word conservative. It should That should just come with the word Republican, similar to saying I'm a Christian. Some people say, well, I'm a born-again Christian. Well, that's kind of, yeah. you know what I mean. It, I, I think it, I so. think it becomes tricky, and and every I mean as you yeah. well know because you've been through the process every year, 
you know, you, you reference the Republican Party platform, and, and a lot of people use platform and then resolutions. Platforms, it's sort of like like the platform is the constitution of the party, and then the resolutions are are statute, the laws of the party, where the platform is about broad ideas, the resolutions are about specific policies. It's a lot of times people use these terms interchangeably, but there's right. always a debate about much as there's a debate about what the Constitution means when, when, when we're trying to apply it to a specific situation, there's always a debate about what the Republican part platform means and what it is. And there's always a debate over resolutions. For instance, on specific policies, you and I, you and I are both pro-life. Um, you and I are both oh, really? uh, are both pro-gun. Um, uh, I am I am, however, in favor of of uh, same sex marriage. Um, I'm also in favor of legalizing marijuana, and I'm open to a debate about maybe legalizing some other drugs too, just because I don't think prohibition is necessarily a bad thing. I'm, I'm assuming that that you're against same sex marriage. I, I I'm less uh, maybe clear on on your position on drugs, but I consider myself a Republican and a conservative, and you consider yourself a Republican and a conservative. But you almost seem to be arguing that there's not any room for us to disagree on some of those issues. And that if I don't agree with your positions on those issues, I don't get to be a Republican anymore. or I can't be trusted anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it depends on how specific you want to get. I think the platform is is usually pretty general. And I, I think, you know, maybe I could answer it this way. What would you say that the general public who is voting for people who have an R by their name, would expect. And I think, you know, I think we could all agree without getting into the weeds of, about recreational marijuana or not, we could, we could all agree that the Republican Party historically, and I think when people pull the lever for an R, uh, lower taxes, lower spending, uh, pro-life, uh, individual liberty, uh, things like that. And, 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 and that's at, the party's fractured at that level there of course there should be room for disagreement on bills and and specific policies and and to what degree uh but i think you have to draw a line somewhere and you have to ask somebody who tells all their constituents hey vote for me because i'm a republican and then this year especially people are are following their voting record Sometimes there's bills that just reflect it really well, and other times there's not. I mean, yeah. and I think we both would probably uh, agree on that. Uh, that's kind of the way I look at it is I don't want to deceive the voter. I want them, you know, I, I feel that we need to be tuned into the people well enough so that when I say a Republican, it means a certain set of things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and well, what, that's what... What, what, what would you make... Um, people People talk a lot about ronald reagan and and he had a rule and I, I don't know if this is apocryphal people attribute it to ronald reagan but it's they call it like the 80 percent rule and it's basically if you and i agree on things 80 percent, at least 80 percent of the time then we could be allies so we could be in the same party we could be in the same movement and yeah. that other 20 percent we're just going to have to live with do you believe in that or does it have to be 100 percent? oh of course i believe in that yeah I, I i think i don't think anybody on either side of the fracture would say a hundred percent, but I, I, again, back to, okay, let's just use spending. Cause that's maybe less controversial. Okay. Um, I would love for, I don't know if you have a team. I wish I had a team that could do this. <laughs> maybe I'll find time to do it myself, but yeah, if you, if you think I have a team, you're overestimating the size <laughs> of my operating budget here. Well, I, here. I thought I was interviewing in the top shelf, uh, uh, first class operation well i like to think that you are but uh <laughs> but it's it's a first class operation with uh one guy i'm a one-man band over here <laughs> well at least in your mind it's first class <laughs> um okay rob so let's take spending uh now i've only been in two sessions my first term and that's what i love about north dakota citizen legislator we're not, we're not professional career and it's really hard to be that so i'm a preacher for a living uh but um take the spending bills or appropriation spending, you know, and I think a big part of the plank is lower spending. That's a big thing, difference between a Republican and a Democrat. We don't, be, we believe that uh, in the free market, that, that individuals should be uh, making their own financial decisions and lower taxes. 
look at all the appropriation bills this session and last session, guess what? A super majority of Republicans, guess how many we said no to? Zero. Zero. That's a very interesting fact. And But you're also you operating know, in a political environment where Republicans control all the committees. In the, the appropriations committees, uh, we have a governor in the executive branch, in every office yeah. of the executive branch. You're, you're, and you're reinforcing my point. Maybe, maybe it's not surprising that Republican budgets are pretty easy to pass in a Republican legislature. I mean, I don't know well, if that's inherently no, no, a bad thing. No, no. If you look, if you look at the red and the green on the on the on the on the board, the the yes, the greens for all, and we're talking millions of dollars. We 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 raised the budget. We hit another record right after a pandemic, where businesses were lost. We increased. We beat last session, <laughs> and last session was a record. We, we exceeded $2 billion increases. We went from 14 to over $16 billion budget. We're, we're almost three times as much as South Dakota now. And, uh, and so how is that small government? If, you know, if you ask some, do, do, do uh, uh, Republicans believe in small, limited government? The voters would say overwhelmingly, yes. How yeah. is growing the government like that? even remotely close. So that's what I'm saying. There's some things you can look at to say, whoa, wait a second here. And that's what's happening. There's a grassroots movement of people. Again, people think it started by the Bastier. I wish it was. I wish we had time. But unfortunately, I have to let you down and say, no, we, we barely have time to find key bills that we think are important. And we just discuss them. Really, that makes up pretty much the whole meeting. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, so some of the organizers that are involved in the Bastia caucus, and I, and, I, and again, the Bastiat Caucus won't release its membership. We would really, I mean, you keep your group well, pretty no, nebulous. Rob, Rob, it's it's me, hard. Say, it's hard me, from the me, outside looking in to, to say well, what I'm what ask, I'm looking at is the same people are popping up at Bastiat Caucus meetings because I've seen a lot of the internal emails of who's invited, and I'm also seeing the people who are popping up at the low school district conventions Rob, pushing Rob. pushing censure measures and everything else. It's the same people. Jared oh, Hendricks what? being one. It's it's like there's like mindedness for sure, but Rob. When you say they won't release the membership, if I had a membership, if you want to know who is, thinks like Bastier as legislators, just look at the votes on the board. Whenever a bill comes up that's related to uh, big spending or you know what we what voters would consider a, a Republican issue, just look at the board. You've got about yeah. anywhere from 15 to 30 people. Well, there's your Bastier. But that's not right but there. that's not necessarily a I, I mean listen, in, well, in, at, at the at the federal level we have the Congressional Black Caucus, we have the Freedom Caucus. These organizations have websites. You could go on their websites, you can look at the membership list. The Bastiat Caucus used to have they never had a specific m membership list, but they had, you know, here's the chairman, here's the secretary, yeah. here's our statement of values. That used to exist, and then all of a sudden it all went down the memory hole. And and again, you're you're saying that you consider this to be the actual Republican Party. Well, the actual Republican Party has a website well, where I can go and I can see who the chairman is, who the vice chairman is, who the national committee members are, who the district chairs are. Why can't the Bastiats be transparent like that? Well, I, that's fine. I mean, if you want to go down that path, it's a it's a bit of a red herring because why when I say when I say Republican, like I'm I'm trying to tell you, I, I mean the the platform, the, the ideology. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, if we had a record district uh, meeting and I asked a few questions related to specific bills I was doing, a hundred percent of the hands went up and um, we just have a ton of support. And if I, and I would, I would say, okay, district, do you want me to attend both the Bastier and I say, sure, I will. I don't necessarily not attend just because uh, I have a huge problem in that sense. It's more, you only have so much time to go to so many meetings and uh, it just doesn't hit high on the priority list. It, it just wasn't worth going. Yeah. The trust level is really low, but I'm not against it. If, if the district said, hey, we want you to go to that one as well, fine, I'd go. To that. If they say, we want you to go to the pro-life caucus, I only went to one pro-life caucus not because I'm not pro-life. It's just, yeah. I mean, actually, th this is the hardest, busiest season I have is, is these four months. And 
and I'm a slow reader, and I try to read everything. I can so. tell you that every other Republican member of, of the House pays dues to, to the Republican House caucus and attends, if not every oh, sure. meeting, but regularly attends the House caucus meetings. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I would say that about all the, all the other Bastier people that I know. Uh, they attend the Repu- I, as far as I know, I don't keep track. Uh, it's this has served, I think, uh, it's it served well for my voting record for our constituents. Uh, but I'm always open to criticism and and changing. Uh, you know, uh, that's that's not a problem. I yeah. Um, how do you feel about? You you've said a few times that 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 there's a trust issue or that you don't trust. Expand on that. I help help us understand that a little bit. Where where's the trust issues with 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 the the mainstream or or, or the, the Republican Party? What 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 does that mean? Well, maybe I can maybe I can answer that this way. That that's a good question. Uh, and uh, I would say this: if you were attending and and trying to hammer out things with uh you know discuss bills in the pro life caucus let's say and you had some people that were filling up your ranks and attending meetings that were actually pro choice it'd be a little bit hard to trust them right that's what i'm talking about so i think there are enough there's uh, enough republican in name only people in the republican party and that's what people are waking up to. So that's what I mean by it. it's it's hard to trust. Uh, you know, I think if you're going to hammer through bills and have discussions, there's got to be a certain level of like-mindedness. And it's just not there. Uh, that's, again, we, you opened the show where I think we agree. This is not a small fracture. It's it's a very big fracture. And, and so... Uh, I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, uh, yeah. and, and again, I don't know the exact size of the Bastiat caucus, but when Representative Becker, well, you know, he I'd was talking about 20, okay, yeah, 20, he, he, he was saying, yeah. well, he was saying 30 dues paying members, maybe the last time they collected dues. He said that, yeah. I think, uh, I think late last year, or maybe it was earlier this year. Yeah, I forget. That's very possible. Yeah. Um, but that was okay. But that's, that's about twice the size of, uh, and, and it, it, ob- that number obviously includes senators too, but we're talking, the Democrats have 14 members in the house. They have seven. So they have what? 20, uh, 21 members of the legislature overall. That means the Bastiat caucus is at least as big as, or bigger than, than the, the democratic caucus in, in the legislature. Well, so when you say it's uh, which, which, which is in support of your point that this is not a small fracture, I agree. Yeah, and, and I would say t- and, and it's a wide fracture. And, you know, when you talked about Ronald Reagan's uh, 80%, you'd probably find that within the, the Bastier. You know, uh, I, I highly respect <clears throat> Rick Becker. I, I like his show, No Apologies. I learn a lot about bills from him. But that doesn't mean we would agree on everything. Uh, but, you know, 80%, yeah. So I think that's where your 80% is right there. Do you, I, you, you, you made, you compared it to the, the pro-life movement and I've, I've been involved with, with pro-life legislation and watching pro-life debates for a long time. And one thing I can tell you, for instance, one of, one of the bills that in, in some of these district meetings that, that lawmakers, the sitting Republican lawmakers are being censured and, and they're being censured on bill scores and they're all Bastiat bills that they're being scored on. And one of the bills is your, is your life bill 1313 which, yeah which right. would have made which would have made uh abortion a felony right uh, i i i don't have the bill in front yeah. of me so i'm trying to yes, remember the, for, for the abortion for the abortionist yeah it would have been okay. a felony a uh, okay. murder okay yes. so i have some very very pro life people that i know and i i'm not going to use their names because i didn't i didn't think that I, they would be coming up sure. and i don't have their permission to use their names but yep. suffice it to say i know some very pro life people who have served the both who are currently in public office who are no longer in public office, but who have spent years of their life dedicated to the pro-life cause, who felt that that bill was too far, who felt that 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 bill was counterproductive to the pro-life movement. I know I don't think I don't think you can. And again, I understand it's a little unfair because I'm not naming these people, but 
Um, and I'm not in a position to, but I mean, I, I don't question their pro-life credentials. I mean, I've, I've seen, I've seen them take the votes. I've seen them, uh, mm. take the actions on policy to yeah. promote this stuff. And I, I don't think that their objection, I object to your bill. I, I thought that that was too far personally. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I think we're allowed to have a position on that, but the problem is when that bill shows up in a local district and, and maybe it's fair to say Bastiat aligned people are saying because you voted against this bill, we're going to censure you because you're not a real Republican. That doesn't sound like a group of people that believe in the 80% rule, Jeff. Well, you know, you're, you're conflating two things. What, what the public is doing with the bills is one thing, but I, I can explain that, uh, what you, the, kind of the, the first question you were asking, uh, if we could start with that, cause I'm a little slow, I'll admit that. Um, I can only handle one question at a time, but, uh, I think what happened with my bill, and and, and actually, you, I, I, you're correct. I would agree with you that that one sort of did divide the pro-life community, but it wasn't the pro-lifeness of it. What it was, was the approach, the strategy. So for 48 years since uh, 1973, Roe v. Wade, it, we've had a pro-life, uh, and I'm a part of it, uh, an incremental approach, incrementalism. Uh my bill really was uh, accompanied with sort of a new concept. It's not a new concept, but it's it's new to bills in North Dakota uh, of nullification. Uh, it's sort of an uh, end abortion now uh, concept. And those things do take a while, uh, but there's been great gains, in fact, uh, with the incrementalism approach because abortion has its own place in the century code. Um, so what I did was I, my bill um, amended the, uh, I, I apologize, can't remember the name of the century code, it's something to do with har harming unborn children. So there's a section in, along with murder and manslaughter uh, of an unborn child. Let's, let's just say, I'll just make, one up that uh, a boyfriend is mad at his girlfriend and he beats her and kicks her in the stomach and the baby dies. That That's not an abortion. That would be in this other century code. So I included abortion in that section. So it, it moved the discussion to abortion being a murder. And that was, that was not necessarily a part of the pro-life discussion with the incremental strategy. And so my, my whole thing is, is that, just like we have nullified for marijuana, uh, you know, there's laws against marijuana, but yet we have said, well, thanks, but no thanks. We're not going to enforce those laws here. That was the approach was, well, OK, thank you, Roe v. Wade, for your uh, your decision back in 1973. But we're not going to murder babies anymore in our state, not legally anyway. So that's kind of, did right. you see? And I don't, right. And I, I, and I understand that. And I don't, oh. I don't really want to debate the tactic. I, I guess me, it's, it's well, more of the divide was though. The right. divide was sure. on the tactic. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, let's, okay. So let's talk about spending. Cause like you said, it's a less controversial, maybe, maybe a less inflammatory topic. Um, you talked about spending and I, I think the headline was that we had, we had record spending this year and I assume you don't like the spending growth. I feel like I have a very strong track record when it comes to spending. I made my bones harping on spending in the Hoven era, um, which routinely was going up 20% every every biennium, uh, general fund spending. Uh, they were trying to hide a lot of the spending by saying, oh, that's one-time spending. During the Dalrymple era, we spent a lot of money. And I am I was one of the first people who was out uh, you know, spiking the football when – the bottom fell out of the oil boom, and all of a sudden the oil revenues weren't flooding into state coffers anymore, and we had to dramatically – it was it was the, pro, the first uh, – when Governor Burgum first took office, we had to dramatically – we had to cut and burn budgets because the revenue just was not there. Um, now, I so I, I my track record on that is pretty clear on spending. I thought that I, – I have no problem calling out overspending when I see it. There is some context here. And again, I don't want to debate specific policy issues, but we also just got a census report that North Dakota is at a record level of population. If our population grows, does it? couldn't you argue also that, that spending is going to grow alongside with it? Because there's just, there's just a certain amount of, of spending that, or, or services 
that people expect from their state government. It's not necessarily uh, anti-conservative or anti-Republican to support spending growth that is A, justified, and B, can be sustained. Is it? Well, I, well yeah, and you you name the qualifiers. They're not justified when they are redistribution of wealth. Give me, give Again, me an example. Okay. Uh, oh, I wish I was more prepared, Rob. Uh, there's a bill number we just did uh, a week ago. Shoot, I think it it might have been it might have been the commerce budget number ten twelve. And I, I pardon me if I I don't have that number right, but That's okay. uh, but and and. And there, there was an appropriations uh, speaker, um, a representative with, I won't name because I, I respect him a lot. I, sure. I really do. Okay. I, I really, really do. Um, but when he described the justification for the list of things that we were going to spend money on, which, by the way, the context is, is we haven't lowered any, uh, no lowered taxes, and we're sitting on a lot of wealth billions and billions of dollars. So, uh, but my point is, is that when he stood up and gave the justification for that bill, I thought to myself, now that was one of the best descriptions of socialism that I have heard all session. And of course he wasn't promoting socialism. I'm not indicating that at all, but I think it's a slippery slope and, and we're doing it inadvertently. We're justifying it. We're justifying redistribution of wealth. That's that's not a free market money. Our economy is much better off. And, you know, I can't remember all the things, but one of them was the uh, the Buffalo uh, Jamestown amusement park. As you know, what was that? Five million. And then there was a 60 million dollar uh, loan, or other. loan, loan uh, from the legacy fund. So and, and, and two two representatives got up and said, we need this, you know. That's what you say when you're a, a redistribution socialist. That's not what you say, in my mind, when that's not what voters think when they pull the R for Republican. Yeah, that's my whole point. But there's I, I think there's uh, for instance, I, I thought I didn't think that the spending on a on on a on the Buffalo Park, the amusement park in Jamestown. I didn't think that that was such a bad idea. And I think there is a fiscally conservative argument to make. One part of it, by the way, was was an investment from the legacy fund. That was going to be a loan that was paid back. The five million, yeah, that's a straight up appropriation. But what kind of benefit do we get back by making our state a more attractive place to live and a more attractive place to come and visit? Well, I mean, listen, our our, our statewide, our, our our national, I see the headline all the time that North Dakota is the least visited state in the union. And we're super boring. People don't want to move to North Dakota because they think that there's nothing to do. And, and let's 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 face it: workforce shortages are a chronic, generational oh. problem in the state of North Dakota. So if we if we invest five million dollars and we build a park, and then that generates tourism, that turns the the Jamestown and the greater Jamestown area, that part of the state, turns it into a a little bit better place to live. And that attracts more workforce. Are we going to get? I mean, can't you argue that we're going to get more than five million dollars well, out of that? D don't take this personal, Robert. You're starting to sound like a really good socialist because yeah. w when we <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm being a little bit funny here, right? Too, and, but, and, and, and I, I think there is a problem with with I, I and I, I have been, I have been flippant with the term socialist too, and I think well, we need we need to not be because socialism is a very okay. real and very dangerous thing, and we need to be careful to not brand benign policy that maybe you and I just don't like brand that as socialism and, and thus dilute well, the actual but, definition of it. But okay. But you went, you went beyond just one spending. You, you got into the whole idea of investing. We shouldn't be investing. It, it's kind of like this when, when Bergam says to us, let's dream together. That's what business owners do. But we as legislators should not be dreaming with your tax money. Uh, it's not ours to give. And so I, I think, who was it? Was that uh, Davy Crockett or somebody like that uh, old legislator? Yeah, I famous remember. phrase, you can Google it. It's not ours to give. Yeah. And again, if you really believe in the free market, um, then uh, that's who should be doing the investing. And that's but but, That's the, all I'm but but the people of North Dakota, for instance, created the legacy fund. 
and now and now we are going to be investing the legacy fund we're making those funds available for to bond infrastructure projects which is probably i mean infrastructure that we're loaning the money to government it's basically a way of of financing government projects with with money that we already have um but but another part of it is we're going to make capital available and again a generational problem in the state of north dakota is a lack of capital we're going to make capital available and and as you're opposed to we're going to invest in in local businesses now again i don't see this as a bad thing and, and you say not ours to give well the legacy fund was created by the legislature and they put it on the ballot and the voters approved it and one of the principal most most loudest voices in favor of it back then was a man by the name of ron ness who is the president of the north dakota petroleum council and where does the legacy funds come from the petroleum industry i, I mean this at some point isn't this well, just the consent of the governed well, I, how about if our first stop is lower taxes then? If what you're saying is true, why have we had no movement? You know, the only thing we did on taxes this year was raise it. So if we've got $4 billion here and $5 billion there and $8 billion here, I, I think we're up to, what, 20-some billion dollars sitting in Bismarck. Okay, fine. Why why aren't we why aren't we lowering taxes then? Yeah. Why aren't we getting rid of property tax? Well, I, 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 but I, I think I think there's an argument you can make there. First of all, I, I don't think the state should do anything on property taxes. I think the state's done too much on property taxes as it is. Property taxes are a tax that's levied by the local level. If you don't like your property taxes, talk to your local government. They're the ones who are levying the property tax. It's not a statewide issue. And and the, the legislature, every time it tries to get involved in property tax relief, it blows up in their face. But if, if we're just going to talk about statewide taxes, I don't know a lot of people. I mean, the legislature already, first of all, has done a lot with with cutting income taxes in past years. I mean, we've, we've cut them down. I remember uh, I was part of an initiated measure process back before I kind of turned my back on initiated measures. But I was part of an initiated measure uh, initiative that would have cut the income tax at the time by 50 percent, the personal income tax. Um, it was rejected, but since then we have cut the, the, the individual income tax by more than 50%. So it's not like the legislature hasn't done income tax relief or hasn't done tax relief. We have. And I agree with you. I, I think the state has too much money sitting around in funds. If we don't, I oppose the creation of the legacy fund because we didn't have a defined purpose for it. Uh, I don't, I'm not in favor of stockpiling people's money up in government coffers for no particular reason at all. I, we have an appropriate level of reserves, and then you give the money back. I'm not against that, but I don't think that necessarily precludes these other things. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, I, I'm assuming you're. I, I'm a. I I was a big Rush Limbaugh fan. I I really miss. I Rush. grew up. I grew up listening to Rush and Limbaugh. I did too. And um, and uh, I would say that we'd probably both agree he was pretty Republican. I mean, he would be about as Republican as you could get. He's the one that taught us the Republican platform, I think, or one of one of the many great ones. And I think uh, Rush Limbaugh repeated many times, the government doesn't create wealth. The, the people do. Free people making decisions about where they're going to spend their money. Yeah. And so that's I also, why. I also have a quote from Rush Limbaugh who was defending Trump era deficit spending. This, of course, is at the national level. Um, where he, he started saying that all this fiscal conservative stuff from Huey from the beginning. He was, quote, he said it on the record, defending Trump level. And uh, by the way, under Donald Trump, the national debt grew more than 40 percent from 2017 to late last yeah. month. Yeah, um, I, 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 I'm with you on that. I, I, I wish I, I did not agree with these stimulus packages, whether it was Bush, Trump, Biden. I don't care. These stimulus packages packages are bad for our, our economy. I think the best president, I go I go way before Reagan. Uh, are you familiar with the Laffer curve, Rob? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So just by doing nothing, when you lower taxes, <coughs> excuse me, the revenue of the government goes up by about built half a tank. And, and not, then not, not every, always. I mean, not not all. It, it takes wow. some even even under Art Laffer's. It takes some very specific economic conditions for a tax okay. cut to pay for itself. OK, fair enough. But. Reagan did that. The problem with Reagan is, is he expanded the budget to meet that extra revenue. Kelvin Coolidge, however, that's a guy to look at because he did the same thing. He lowered taxes. And then at the same time, as the revenue was coming in from 
the free market uh, because a dollar exchanges, I think, at seven times a year. And so you, you, you get taxes. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just. Oh, um, I, uh, he he reduced the budget. He had all the committees. He <laughs> called it the one percent clubs and the two percent clubs. He wanted all agencies to reduce their budgets uh, along with the lowering of taxes. And I think that's how you stimulate the economy. Yeah. Not not by, not by giving money, redistributing money. And we're going to see it's going to get real bad, Rob, because we're going to pay for this with twenty dollar hamburgers before you know it. That's how we pay. Well, for this at, at the national level, I agree with you. I'm not sure how that translates in, into opposing. Say, and and I mean the amusement park thing. I don't know. You can go either way. I mean, there's. I I think you can make you can make valid arguments both ways on that one. Um, uh, let me ask you this, because one thing that bothers me sometimes about what, what, what rankles my feathers, sometimes I look at the Bastiat Caucus and I see it, it, they fall into a dangerous trap that that, that that I think conservatives are particularly susceptible to, which is the perception that we're just against everything and we're not really standing for everything. And that's really a criticism I have of of the Trump era is a lot of times it just seems like it boils down to culture war and opposing whatever it is that liberals are for. And I think conservatives have to be about more than that. I think they got to hold themselves to a higher standard. It can't just be, yes, it's partly about fighting bad policy, but it can't just all be culture war. It also has to be implementing conservative ideas. I, In fact, I think that the reason why the North Dakota Republican Party has been as dominant as it has, as I described at the beginning of the interview, is because it's it's found it, it has its roots in sound government. It has its its roots in competent government. I think the voters feel North Dakota has been governed competently for a long time now, which is why they keep pushing the button for Republicans statewide. Uh, mm. In all in all but a, in all but a few pockets where where Democratic lawmakers win. Um, I think I think that's that's what works. That's what wins elections. Yeah. That's what conservatives have to be um, for. I, you know what, Rob, I'll accept that criticism. I'll, I'll personally accept that criticism. That's maybe an area that I need to watch out for. Um, let me say this, and this gets back to my strategy, my philosophy, which, you know, I'm, st I'm still learning. I may need to improve on this. I learned this from a, a Republican retired senator from another state. He wrote a book, can't remember, I think it's called Confrontational Politics. Anyway, he said that what liberals do is they keep pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope. They're, they initiate that. They're on the offense until the conservatives finally throw up their hands and say, stop, no more. And then the whole scale has moved to the left because, okay, we'll stop here and then we compromise. So part of my strategy sometimes, not all the time, is – a belief that conservatives, not, need, we need to start pushing the envelope to the right until the liberals start voting differently than the Republicans and say, stop, stop, stop. And then the compromise, we got to move the middle back to the right. So that that's yeah. basically like my abortion bill, 1313 was like that. It pushes the envelope back to the right. But is it successful? Because by your own admission, your your bill divided even the pro-life movement. But it was successful because now the conversation. But it wasn't. It, time, it, it didn't. It didn't. Be, it didn't even make it out of the house. No, I, it wasn't successful by votes, but it was successful in moving the conversation over to where it needs to be. And I I believe that eventually, that uh, in fact we already are. There's already now where there wasn't before a recognition that. Uh, that part of the century code is a good place for an abortion bill. So we are moving the conversation over when we do that. And you could, you could apply that to any number of conservative causes. And, uh, you know, part of it depends on, do you want an immediate victory now? Well, then I give that to you, but, th but, or are you going to think long-term we've been fighting the abortion issue for 48 years. We have been murdering, sucking babies through vacuum tubes legally and of any issue i think rob we would agree when is north dakota going to say yeah. no sorry we don't do that here 
We, yeah. we love you too much. So uh, at what time, I mean, because because I understand what you're saying. And, and part of it is tied up. There's a concept called the Overton window. Have you heard about this? Um, no. Okay, so the Overton window is, is a concept. And it was uh, it was developed by, I'm forgetting the gentleman's name, but he worked for the Mackinac Center, which is a, a conservative organization based in Michigan. And what, what essentially what it is, is it's the idea that at any given moment in American history, there is a window that encompasses all of what what a majority or, or what, what 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 would be considered mainstream political thinking so you know at one time in our nation's history slavery in, in parts of our country was considered in balance obviously the windows moved on from there thankfully um but you, you understand what i'm saying and so so the argument is is that it's the job of of people who are engaged in political movements or political activism to move the window towards the policies that they want to become acceptable, which I think is what you're talking about. But then there's the other argument, and I, I felt this way. I remember when I was first getting involved in politics, and it felt that way. It felt like, as conservatives, we were going up against progressives and liberals, and they would they would oppose 100%, and this is just me throwing out figures but to, to illustrate the point, but they would throw out 100% spending increase, and the conservative position would be, oh, we can't increase spending that much. Let's only increase it 50 percent. And then, you know, we increase spending 50 percent and it's a conservative victory because we didn't increase it 100 percent. Then we come to the next legislative session and we do it again. And enough victories like that and you lose the war. Right. And so I, I'm wondering, though, is, is, if, is, is the solution to that to just keep fighting harder for the same things or to try something different? So, so for instance, on abortion. If we can't, if we, if the courts keep striking down bans on abortion, and if the public's not getting behind, um, you know, outright bans on abortion, is is it time to look at maybe preventing abortions through other ways, like maybe promoting sex education and birth control? Well, uh, you know, that's 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 been tried for forty eight years too, and I'm not saying that, I'm not against those things at all. I'm saying both, but I think nullification again is is kind of new. You brought up slavery. Uh, I'm glad that nullification is not new. I mean, nullification goes back no, no. Uh, like like Wisconsin I mean, I mean, nullified ignored, the Fugitive sorry, Trade you, Act, for instance. You're right. No, it's not a new concept. What I meant is it's new in North Dakota bills. We're seeing it more this year. I think we had and I was very happy to see it. I think we had three or four bills that had some form of nullification in it. And uh, it, it's being considered more legitimately, I guess. That's what I mean in North Dakota. And, and those were general nullifications ones. My abortion bill was a specific nullification bill. But that's what I'm talking about. I'm glad that they had this approach for slavery. Slavery was not won by incrementalism. It was won by abolitionists like uh, William Wilberforce, who just said, absolutely, 100% wrong. And then it took him a number of sessions. He didn't yeah. accomplish it right away, but we got rid of slavery. And thankfully, it was the Constitution that actually, uh, I mean, getting back to the Constitution is what freed. Yeah. Uh, but if you, but if you, I mean, if, if you want to use slavery and, and the Civil War era and that debate as a, as a metaphor maybe for today, then I would I would invoke the name of John Brown who was a rabid abolitionist, an abolition, you know, in, in favor of a cause that both you and I support, which obviously the abolition of slavery, uh, but was, was, was an abolitionist using, at times, extremely violent and murderous tactics. And so, oh. you know, it, 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 sometimes, sometimes his, his role in the abolitionist movement is debated to this day. Did he help or did he hurt? Well, that's, and, and that's, so, that's a, so obviously, I'm not, I'm not, uh, nothing that, that you're proposing obviously is, is violent. I mean, that's not my you. suggest at all. Thank but, you. No, that's a red herring. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. I don't. I'm not, not suggesting that at all. That you're violent. But there is an argument to be made that if, if you're proposing divisive bills, are you doing more harm than good? Because I think political movements win by adding people, by attracting more people to the cause, not by separating people or issuing purity tests saying. You know, you're not pure enough to be trusted or you're not pure enough to be a part of our movement. Well, I, you know, I mean, if we're if we're still hovering on the abortion issue, how long how much longer should we wait? I mean, we've waited 48 years and and fair enough, I think uh, I, I, I 
if there was an incrementalist bill that came up next time, I would vote for it. But I just think, why not do both? Why, why does it have to be either or? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, because because at the end of the day, if, if a bill fails, you know, it's just another year that goes by that that we're still doing this stuff. I I, well, I, I mean, you don't it, it doesn't it doesn't count as a victory until the policy is law and it stands as law and it gets enforced. Well, as law. here's where the gains are happening, though. And, uh, you know, getting away from the abortion issue, just on sure. other ones like nullification. See, when you I think when you stand and you have convictions that that resonate with the people's core values, uh, people will get off the couch for that. I don't think people, the people outside the Capitol, they're not going to jump off the couch for for moderate positions. There's nothing there. Uh, you don't have to be angry when you're a moderate. I would say that there's a reason for the, there's a reason for being angry when you are uh on the right or the left end of the spectrum, because it means you really believe in something. And when you take a stand, that gets people excited. They're on the move and there's a lot of like-mindedness. And I think that's yeah. going to show up in the next election. I frankly. mean, I, I, I think that's appealing in, I, I've often described this as probably the most populist age in, in American history. And I think a lot of it has to do with social media, which is just that, yeah, more than ever before, I mean, every, everybody has a platform in their pocket that they could potentially reach millions of people with, depending on, you know, how, how popular their their content is. So I, I, that has made us very, very populist. And I think that has, has created a situation where people think that passion and anger are, are virtues and that they're helpful to making good policy. And I, I just I don't think that's true. And in fact, I would argue well, that that the American system of government was originally designed and we've gotten away from it in a lot of ways. For instance, we don't the states, uh, the Senate's popularly elected now as opposed to being appointed by the legislature. But our government, our federal government was was designed to work slowly and to not just necessarily operate on a 50 plus one majoritarian basis uh, very often in our system of government super majorities are required to pass laws we have the filibuster in the united states or, uh, well we're all, the filibuster's hanging on by a thread in the united states senate it's already been eroded in many ways but it um i mean we had a lot of these what 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 you could probably say is, is anti-democratic positions and i they were put in place if you read the federalist papers and you read the founders they were put in place to tamp down the very sort of, of anger and emotion in the electorate that you're describing. Well, I, I guess what I meant, and thank you for giving me a chance to clarify. Sure. I'm just saying the anger is is inevitable. I, I mean, getting off the couch doesn't have to be, I mean, that. I'm not trying to conflate that with an angry mob uh, mentality. I'm just saying that... Um, if you have, if you actually stand for something and you can, you have a conviction. Uh, you now they write songs about that for a good reason. Um, marriages stay together because people have a conviction that, no matter how I feel, uh, by golly, God wants us to s remain together. That's a conviction. But if we have moderate views of these things, um. I don't know if that's, you know, in terms of helpfulness, yeah. I think that's a lot less helpful. But but do you think, do you think, I mean, because he, here's the thing also, is that there's no such thing as a permanent political victory, right? Nobody's, nobody's in office. There's always another election coming. And there, there's really no part of our laws, up to and including the United States Constitution, that is written in stone. We, we have the mechanisms in place to change even oh. something as sacrosanct as the First Amendment or the Second Amendment. Now, I don't think that you could. I think that if somebody right. was trying to remove the freedom of speech from the Constitution, yeah. that would that I don't, that would think that would go anywhere in the United States. Yeah. But it's possible. Uh, the mechanisms there, we could do it if the proper majorities existed. But again, it wouldn't be majorities. Well, it would have to be super majorities. So I, I guess. And, and, and can I add to that, Rob? Sure. It would be a group of people who do not understand history, and you see. Right. It, this is an education problem, too, is that we need to regain an educated electorate. That's part yeah. of our problem. We live in a shallow well, soundbite. That's why, frankly, I like your show being a half hour long. 
we talked about this earlier. Well, we're we're going we're going on an hour now, so. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, I got a I got a freedom rally. I got to speak at. <laughs> well, we're, we're we're having fun. I'll I'll let you go here in a couple minutes, but it uh I you know I to to your point about um moderates, I I just my argument is that we still have to live. I mean, we have an election, we have a debate, we pass a bill, and then we're still going to see each other in the grocery store, right? We still have to live together. Um, oh, yeah. Attitudes about policy issues change over time. Um, there was a time, I mean, in, it, not that really all that long ago, 70 plus percent of North Dakotans passed an amendment to the state constitution outlawing same-sex marriage. I don't think that amendment would pass today in North Dakota. I think attitudes have changed. Yeah. Maybe you disagree, but well, the well, point is was, attitudes I, change over time. So I, I, I just, if, 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 if you get, if you, everybody gets really angry and then we jam some policy down everybody's throats. I mean, <laughs> Democrats did that with Obamacare. They passed it on a strict partisan vote. And what did that do to our country? Tore us yeah. apart. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, Rob. Uh, I'll meet you halfway on that. I, you know, I've, I've got, uh, I, I'm, I'm a new legislator. Uh, every session that the Lord wants me in, uh, I'll be there. And if not, that's fine too. Uh, but I want to grow and I want to learn every time. Some of the strategies that I use this session, maybe they need to be jettisoned and improved upon. In fact, I do plan on writing letters to some key people to evaluate me and say, hey, what are some strengths and weaknesses help me grow and become better because you know we are a citizen legislator this is not my profession but i will say this the strategy that i uh used you can't put it all on the bastier number one and two we had a record attendance at just a basically a normal district meeting right here uh this spring and they were enthusiastic. They weren't angry mob. They were enthusiastic. And there's a lot of excitement happening around. And that's not, I'm not saying that's credit to me. That's a credit yeah. to Oli. It's a credit to Bob. But all three of us, we, you know, we have what maybe you could say are a lot more conservative. I would say Republican, however you want to phrase it. And guess what? The, the people are excited about it. So yeah, I I, you know, I don't I I, I, I I will close. I like enthusiasm, but I I think we got to have a big tent. I I think we're not going to win without it. And I have a lot of problems when people are showing up. And again, it's hard for me not to associate it with the Bastiat Caucus when the censures are based on the expulsion of a Bastiat lawmaker and they're based on votes on Bastiat bills. It's hard not to see some alignment there. We're well, there is happen. alignment. Like, there's sure. like-mindedness, but okay. there, I, I'm just saying that. I don't. Th uh, I don't think that just happens in one district after another without some organization, right? Well, I, I, I have no doubt it's organized, yeah. but I'm just saying I wish it was the Bastier because I've, I've gone to every meeting and I don't remember well, any conversation. I, I'm their cheerleader, that's for sure. But uh, you know, sometimes I, I you just have time. to put a name to a thing, and it's it's a thing that's happening, and the the alignment, the, ali the, the, the alignment, like you said, is there. I have a problem showing up and censuring Republican lawmakers who have been in office for a long, long time and and saying, you don't get to be a part of our movement. You're not a Republican anymore. If that attitude, if it proliferates too far, is going to be what brings the Democrats back into office in our state. I'll, well, I'll, I'll let you, I, I know you got to get running, so I'll let you respond to that and then we'll wrap things up. OK, uh, let, let me just respond to the question. What if your legislator you found out really wasn't a Republican? What, how would you feel about that? Yeah, well, I, but again, I mean, the, the, the definition of who is and is not a Republican is is not necessarily your debt. My definition is not necessarily your definition. But so. there is a voting record. Though. Right. But and we, and we, we have we have a process for that. They can be well, recalled. Uh, they can be they can be replaced at the next election. They can be denied the district nomination. They can be not denied the nomination on the June ballot. Um Censuring people, really, it seems mean spirited to me, and it seems I, I, antithetical to growing a movement. That seems like shrinking well, a movement. Well, I personally, I really do believe, and again, I don't know this. You know, I I know of one district where I know a few people out of all those districts. The only ones where I actually know people, it was a district nearby, and uh, you know, of all the people that showed up at their meeting, I don't know what it was, thirty or forty. Um, I was told there's actually three hundred that that 
we're like-minded with that. So it's not a small yeah. thing. And I, I would, um, I had another thought. I, I can't, I'm a little tired. We, we went till midnight yeah, last night. I know, night, so. I know. <laughs> I just rolled back to my hunt. So, well, I, I'm not trying to rush you off air. I know you gotta, I know you gotta go. Um, or I, I, you, you it was a Luke, I'm sorry. It was the Luke Simons issue. I think sure. that really drove a lot of the people to start taking a look at what's going on. Yeah. And I know we don't have time for that issue. I'm just saying yeah. wherever you're at on it, I personally, and all the people I've talked to the, the due process issue, I think it would do legislators real well to take a serious look at that so i'll just maybe, end with that maybe and, um yeah. although although 69 members of the house including 55 republicans voted for expulsion um i don't know that those feelings are as widespread maybe as you that, think they are but well, in the legislature but that's part of the problem so but maybe yeah maybe i i would i would argue probably in the next election most of those lawmakers the ones that are on the ballot are, are going to get reelected. but we'll we'll see um jeff Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. We could probably go for another hour, but uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. All right. Thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm.